Fishingthechehalis.net has dedicated this video to showing the apparent bias historically residing within the Department of Fish and Wildlife that results in recreational fishing license holders being placed at significant disadvantage to commercial license holders in the Chehalis Basin and neighboring Willapa. The information and documentation presented in this video was acquired from either the public domain or during a public document request of the department's own files. The documents and records acquired during the PDR are available for viewing in the Fishy Leaks Library posted on this website. Using one or more Excel spreadsheets, the process of allocating the available harvest begins each year when WDFW first determines an estimate of the salmon it believes will return to the coastal estuaries of Grace Harbor and the Willapa. The number of salmon within each stock that the department determines it wants to reach the spawning ground or hatchery of origin is called the escapement goal. The escapement goal is then subtracted from the estimated run size that is expected. The difference between the two is the harvestable number. Up until this point, most decisions are typically not considered controversial. In a very controversial public meeting process called North of Falcon, or NOF for short, the department then determines the allocation of the available harvest between recreational and commercial license holders. Many recreational fishers participating through the years have become very disenchanted with the process and often referred to NOF as a dog and pony show. The criticism comes from their belief the department has already made its determination of what it's going to do before it hears from the public. As a result, many recreational fishers have walked away from the process. As an example, in 2012, participants reported that the morning session of the Olympia meeting seemed encouraging. Management was actually listening to the positions offered by recreational fishers and conservationists in attendance. As they broke for lunch, they noticed upper management had joined them. When all came back from lunch, the recs immediately noticed a difference and a distinct change in the tone of the meeting, as they called it. One commented, well, we now know it's not safe to go out for lunch. One first needs to understand the difference between a commercial fisher and a recreational fisher. There's little difference between a piece of paper when it's in one's wallet. Using the privileges granted under that license in the wallet is another matter. The fundamental difference between a commercial license holder and a recreational license holder is what the license holder intends on doing with the catch. The commercial fisher is allowed to sell its catch for a profit. The recreational license holder is forbid from selling its catch and expected to only use the fish for his or her personal consumption and enjoyment. The commercial regulations adopted by the Fish and Wildlife Commission controls the type of gear, the days one can fish, the geographical location where one is allowed, and the amount of fish one can retain during each day of the fishing season. Fish and Wildlife Commission adopts another set of rules and regs for the recreational license holders. The commercial fisher is basically divided into two types of nets that are used to harvest salmon. One is the seine net. The primary method used in Grace Harbor and the Willapa, the other is the gill net. Contrary to many other states, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife does not allow a recreational license holder to harvest salmon using a boat or a cast net, a spear gun, or a dip net. In Washington State, WDFW has decided a recreational license holder can only use a fishing pole.
Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife sets a season that allows the license holder to use the license on certain particular days of the year. The shorter commercial season typically has the nets go in at a time when salmon runs are expected to reach their highest level of concentration. While the recreational season is longer, the lack of fish in the river often results in the boat in the driveway and the recreational fisher holders watching the ball game. Typically, the commercial license holder can take as many each day as it can be held in the boat. If not limited to catch and release only, the recreational license holder is fortunate if able to be able to keep one or two fish per day. Commercial guild netters operating in the lower Chehalis and estuaries of Grace Harbor and Willapa use large nets that can extend hundreds of feet. In the lower reaches of the Chehalis, the nets will be stretched nearly shore to shore, extending from near the top of the surface of the water to the bottom of the river channel. The recreational license holder is limited to a single line which is as long as he or she can cast. The gill net is extremely effective at not only blocking the path of the fish, but capturing them and dragging them on board. The recreational license holder fishing for salmon cannot use many types of lures that are effective at landing fish. Fish and Wildlife typically requires a recreational license holder to use a single barbless hook. If the hook bot has a barb to keep the fish on the line, the recreational license holder has to break it off or bend it closed. Welcome to the experience known as the barbless hook. We'll talk to you later on, guy. Oh. Oh. Fishing the Jehalis.net sought to see if there was any merit to many recreational license holders' criticism that they believe the department really doesn't want them to catch any fish just by a license. In 2009, WDFW hired Responsive Management to do a study that would identify trends and preferences of recreational license holders so the department could use the information to increase the sales of recreational licenses. The sales consultants identified the motivations for buying a license as to catch a large fish, to catch a fresh fish, for the sport or recreation, to be close to nature, to be with family or friends, or for relaxation. The report advised WDFW that, quote, fishing to catch fresh fish and fishing to catch a large fish have declined in importance while fishing for relaxation and fishing to be with family and friends have increased in importance. Fishing the Shehalis.net has not been able to confirm whether WDF management actually believes it can increase sales of recreational licenses without the license holder being able to actually catch a fish. It is relevant to note that one can relax on the banks of a river or in a boat with family or friends and not buy a fishing license from WDFW. WDFW claims to gauge itself by the end result. We have a different way of thinking today than we did when we started, and that is to start at the end. Taking Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's end result approach, let's compare a decade of the historical catch of salmon in Grace Harbor and its tributaries by the commercial license holders with the catch WDFW allowed recreational license holders. 
For Chinook, the commercial nets captured 285,689, or 82.2% of the fish from 1981 to 2010. For Coho, the commercial nets captured 914,296, or 78.9% .9 of the harvestable coho from 1980 to 2010. For the chum, the nets got 477,881, or 93.9% .9 of the available harvest. With all species combined, the commercial nets got 1,677,866 fish, or 83.2% of the total available harvest. The commercial nets in the Chehalis Basin include tribal fishers that are legally entitled to half the salmon harvest under the controversial Bolt decision. Volume 2 of Debunking the Myths series posted on FishingTheChehalis.net compares the real impacts of Bolt and other legal decisions with often inaccurate public perceptions. As we move to the Willapa, it is important to note that all the commercial nets used in the Willapa are operated by non-treaty fishers holding commercial licenses issued by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Now let's compare the historical harvest of salmon by commercial license holders in Willapa Bay and its tributaries with the harvest WDFW allowed recreational license holders over there. For Chinook, the commercial nets captured 291,333 or 82.6% of the fish from 1990 through 2010. For Coho, the commercial nets captured 669,795 or 91.4% of the fish. With Chum, the nets got 328,041 or 97.9% .9 of the Chum available for harvest. With all species combined, the commercial license holders got 1,289,169 salmon, or 90.8% of the available harvest. Why does WDFW so heavily favor commercial license holders over recreational license holders? On its website under Commercial Fishing, WDFW offers the following clue. Quote, additionally, because there is insufficient harvest on the hatchery runs, thousands of excess or surplus fish returning to our hatcheries or to the spawning grounds rather than being caught for their intended purpose, fisheries. This philosophy is often referred to inside and outside the department as the only good salmon is a dead salmon rule. And even though they are the ones that impose the limitations on the recreational license holder, the commercial license holder is a much better killer of salmon. As they say, one needs to keep their eye on the ball. Years of experience working in or with the department leads many to believe that WDFW is so committed to, quote, killing all the available salmon that it loses its perspective and makes management decisions that are actually harming stocks it is supposed to be protecting. You'll see more about this in Volume 1 of Debunking Myths, titled, Where Did All the Salmon Go? Let's do the math to see who gets the bang for the buck out of the WDFW licensing program. According to the marketing plan shown earlier, Approximately 140,000 recreational licenses are typically sold in the coastal region. A recreational freshwater license is $29.50, saltwater is $30.05, and a combo is currently $54.25. Non-Washington residents pay significantly more.
An in-state commercial gillnet license is $585. If one assumes 140,000 recreational fishers at $40, WDFW would have collected approximately $5.6 million in license fees in the coastal region in 2012. With approximately 25 commercial gillnet licenses operating in Grace Harbor, the Chehalis, and Willapaw, WDFW would have collected approximately $14,625 in commercial license fees. This math projects an estimate that 99.7% of the fishing license fees collected by WDFW in the coastal region came out of the pocket of the recreational fisher. As little as three-tenths of 1% comes from the commercial guild owners. So what's the end result, as they say, of WDFW's harvest management plan in the Chehalis Basin and Willapaw? Over the last decade, WDFW allocated commercial nets 90.8% of the salmon in the Willapaw and 83% of the salmon in Grace Harbor Chehalis with the knowledge that recreational license holders paid over 99% of the license fees collected by WDFW in the area to support the cost of the hatcheries and other management expenses. The result is a phenomenal subsidy provided by WDFW out of the public treasury to a small number of fortunate commercial license holders. While it's quite apparent the recreational fisher is not on a level playing field with the commercials, the further one goes upriver, the worse it gets for the recreational license holder. The Chehalis River is 215 miles long, creating a basin extending to portions of Jefferson, Grace Harbor, Thurston, Lewis, Cowlitz, Pacific, and Wakaikum counties, and all the water flows into Grace Harbor. As you've learned earlier, approximately 83% of the salmon available for harvest end up in commercial nets used in the bay and the lower end of the river. Of the remaining 17% allocated recreational license holders, WDFW sets different seasons and rules for recreational fishers that vary between the different geographical areas of the basin. WDFW establishes a season for the bay or the salt water of Grace Harbor. Then different rivers in the lower area are opened up. The majority of the river recreational catch occurs in the Hump Tulips, the Wainoochee, and the Satsip. Fishingthehalish.net estimates that by the time the salmon runs reach the town of Elma, over 97% of the harvestable salmon that cross the bar between West Park and Ocean Shores have been effectively removed from the Chehalis River Basin. Now that you've viewed the end result of WDFW's historic allocation of the available harvest, we hope you can take the time to view the other video presentations currently showing on fishingthechehalis.net. Now that you know what's happening, the Creative Accounting Series has been developed to show you how it's done. Previously, you viewed the selective fishing video that shows the correct manner in which fisheries management can use commercial nets in some instances to target abundant stocks while protecting others that are at risk. Volume 1 of the Creative and Counting series documents how WDFW has installed a selective fisheries in the shadeless that violates nearly every principle of selecting fishing endorsed by the department. You watch with your own eyes what has become known as the Chehalis Fling, where thousands of at-risk Chinook and Chum salmon were killed in 2002 in the lower stretch of the river and thrown overboard to the wading seals on the surface and the crabs on the bottom. Volume 2 will show you how the department has abandoned fish management and conservation principles used for other species to combine all the Chum stocks in the entire basin into one fictitious fish known to the department as the Grace Harbor Chum. Meanwhile, stocks of upriver chum, known to be at risk, continue to disappear from view. 
Volume 3 will show the department's practice of dividing the commercial fisheries in the Chehalis Basin into three different entities, resulting in an inaccurate appearance of fairness to recreational license holders. If in the future you'd like to enjoy spending quality time with your family, or simply reacting, and while do so, actually catch a fish on a pole, we think you'll find the time spent viewing the videos to be well worthwhile.